Starting with the NBA today and starting with the headline, which is very obvious, and that's the Thunder's win against the Celtics at home, 127-123, one of the best regular season games, a lot of anticipation, finals preview, who knows? Uh, I want to get to all of that kind of stuff. You know, it's funny, as I was watching the game, I go, you know, I think the Thunder topic is what I want to open with, even if they had lost a close one. Now, if they'd gotten blown out, the timing of this wouldn't be right. There's an aside, too, of all of this where I think how different we would talk about the NBA if there were just one game a week. Because I still think the way that the NFL is discussed week to week, where you just have these results and they have to mean something because you have six days in between the next game, where with this many NBA games, even though I know no one likes a long schedule, it there's enough games to kind of get lost so you don't really feel like you have to have every result mean something. So even if the Thunder had lost, I probably was going to do a big positive Oklahoma City Thunder segment here today. And they were in control of this game. I know it got close there late, and it was a really nice win uh, to go along with a bunch of wins that they've had here recently. So let's spend some time on Oklahoma City. They're one game behind Minnesota in the West. Uh, they beat Denver this week. That was 119-93. They held Jokic to 10 field goal attempts and zero free throw attempts in that game. Um, they beat Minnesota earlier. 129-106. They shot 61%, had 10 less turnovers in Minnesota. Uh, SGA had 40 against Denver, 34 against Minnesota. And last night, he has 36 against Boston. So if you look at last night's game, the reason Boston was able to kind of stay in it because Oklahoma City was just lighting it up immediately. They had 17 offensive rebounds. Um, and Oklahoma City actually took 12 less free throws because there are some Thunder games where I'll look at the result and be like, okay, wait, was Shea cooking at the free throw line here again? Where I do feel like in this, I feel like there's a spike in free throws for the high usage guys, which could be its own math explanation of, yeah, sure, higher usage. I need to dig into some of this stuff with this free throw debate that's been going on for a couple of weeks here because I know what I see and I still feel like Offensive players initiating contact are being rewarded at a level that's just bad for the game. But that's that's another thing I need to spend more time on because I know there's some math that, that could dispute it. But with SGA, whenever I watch him get to like a free throw barrage night, I feel like a lot of them are more warranted. Hey, an up fake and the guy gets up off the ground and you, you, you up fake the jump shot and then lean into him. You know, that one I'm OK with. <laughs> that's that's the one that I'm like, dudes have been doing that forever. You know, guys are doing that in the backyard right now. So I don't have an issue, I feel like, with SGA's big free throw nights as I do with some other players in the league. Um, the first thing I was looking for were defensive matchups. I mean, it's the first thing I look at. Is there anything in there? And specific to what Boston wanted to do is they wanted to put Porzingis on Giddy for a good chunk of this game. It's how they started to allow Porzingis to roam off of Giddy. And that completely backfired. Uh, Giddy hit two threes in the first quarter. He was, I don't know if this term, I don't know if I like it or don't like it, but I've heard it, so I'll just use it because I think it makes sense. It showed a maturity level with the Thunder. There was a few plays in there where we're like, okay, wait, if the game plan is to ignore Giddy, then Giddy needs to be more shot ready, right? Like, don't dick around with the basketball here. Know that you're going to have a lot of space. And I thought Przingis was laid on a bunch of closeouts too, but it was also asking him to do a lot to help on drives because Oklahoma City just feels like it's this constant, it's this succession of curling drives of players with the ball in their hands, getting angles, you know, decent sized guys, if not big on the perimeter, getting in, getting physical. You saw Shea bump Derek White off of him. You saw Lou Dort on some of these drives. They had to change the defensive assignment a couple times with Shea, and it didn't really matter. Uh, he's just that good. He gets wherever he needs to get on the floor. He's very crafty. He's fast when he needs to be fast. He's slow when he needs to be slow. You know, sometimes he looks like he's really slow out there, but it's he's standing two, three feet away from the rim. You're in front of him, and you're actually helpless because he's going to get the angle. He's going to give you the little fake. He's a below-the-rim player that's, like, unstoppable when he's in close. So when I'm watching this defensive deal, Giddy starts firing from outside. Now, when he came into the league, uh, he was 26% from three to then 33% last year, 37% this year. Uh, his numbers are down across the board because he's actually playing less minutes as his team gets deeper and deeper. 31 minutes per game last year, 25 this year. But there was a play that I think spoke to how just connected this Thunder team is. Uh, late in the first quarter, it's 22-19. Kenrich Williams drives he knows based on you know playing out the first quarter that if Przingis is aligned off a of giddy 
then he's probably helping to my drive. Kenrich knows it. He throws a ball back out to Giddy at the three-point line. The ball, the pass is essentially back behind him, like over his head, but it was all because of his understanding. And this can sound really simple. Hey, man, they've played it out for 10 minutes like this. He should be aware of it. Hey, man, I see plenty of teams or players that never figure this stuff out. <laughs> and once they knew the defensive rules for Porzingis and with Giddy and what they were going to try to do, Kenrich is like, yeah, sure, I'll just drive. I'm going to take you left. I get closed off. I'm just going to throw it back out to Giddy. He's wide open, dribbles in, baseline runner, another bucket for him. I loved that play, okay? Loved it because it showed that Kenrich was thinking about another option as opposed to, well, I have the ball in my hands and I'm in the paint, so I guess I just have to shoot it. Um, Presti, when you ask about Sam Presti, the man who's in charge of this roster, because uh, if you ask him, he's not going to tell you anything. Trust me, we've tried to get him on the show a couple times. I appreciate the annual Tribe Call Quest uh, text that I usually send him once a year or something, and um, <laughs> that's about it. But look, I really like him. He's been super nice to me, but he is not one that is going to share, and good for him, right? But <laughs> he, whenever I ask other teams, I'm like, what do you think he's doing? What do you think he's doing? The constant, and this is played out with the construction of this roster, the constant that you hear from other teams is that Presti wants, and I've, I've shared this before, but I'm going to hammer this point now because it played out this way. They want multiple decision makers. Like they want a bunch of players out there who can have the ball in their hands, who can hit a shot, who can dribble drive, who can pass, can move, can reset on the perimeter. If they're bigger, even better, right? Because that's also what he's done. But when you watch them play and you run through the roster, you're like, okay, these guys are all multiple skill set players. SGA is that. Giddy is certainly that with his playmaking and the improved shooting. Uh, Jalen Williams, J Dub, incredible scorer. You know, they went with SGA a bunch of times, and then to close the game, they went with J Dub twice, where they actually worked him into a Tatum switch, and he got Tatum on a step back because they're that comfortable with his scoring ability and that decision making in that kind of game. Now, granted, it's not game seven, but that was a big game last night, and they're like, we're cool. Let's let's actually run something different here, a different action, and get the ball out of SGA's hand. We'll run a switch, and you're going to be in control of this possession for two two attempts in a row. That's that's incredible stuff for a player that's that young. Uh, Dort has a little bit to him, and beyond the defense, but if he has the ball in his hands, I don't know that you're like, look, you're not going to ISO him all night, but he's not helpless like some of these other 3 and D players. Chet is multiple, all right? Chet allows you to do different things, and on top of everything else, He's going to draw your other big away because you have to respect him so much as a shooter and the ball handling. Look, I know there's a bit of a Chet Wemby thing going on here. Like Wembenyama is still based on projections, the guy you take 10 out of 10 times. But Chet, as of today, looks much better getting into his offense than Wembenyama does. He just does. He also has a way easier job because the team around him is really good. And it's actually like there's a plan there where San Antonio's, you know, just not as good. Obviously, look at the standings. Not breaking news. Kaysen Wallace, another one of these guys who can do a bunch of different things. Michic, he brings the ball up for him. I've seen him in games this season where he's running the possession. Um, Usman Jang, my guy. The reason they took him is because he's like 6'9 and learned how to play at a pick and roll in the Australian League last year. So this is who they are. This is what other teams knew they were like, Hey, why are they driving? Again, it wasn't like they predicted all this stuff, but they're like, it seems like this is what Presti wants to do, and it's exactly what has happened. And when you watch them close games, you're like, these guys are all pretty smart, and they're all a threat in not just individual ways, but multiple ways. So let's look at some stats. They're fifth on offense right now in the league. They're third on defense. They are a little lower in the total passing numbers. You know, despite how much I've talked about their passing, their total passes per game, you track that kind of stuff. Look, Dallas Clippers are always at the bottom. Um, Oklahoma City is kind of like middle of the pack, but a lot of that's because SGA is just so good running this isolation stuff. You start looking at the drive numbers for SGA, you're like, my God, this guy just like, you almost would Tatum to be like, hey, do you see what happens when you just keep driving the entire time? Because Tatum's drive numbers are actually really good. They're just low. Um, if you look at, some of the other field goal percentage stuff. They're third in field goal percentage. They're number one from three in the league right now. They're number one from the free throw line. 
uh, right now. One thing I really liked, because I started looking at some of the shot chart stuff, the restricted area, they actually aren't as high in attempts as you might think with SGA, but that's because their mid-range stuff is really good. If you go from 10 to 14 feet, they are fourth in attempts per game from that area of the floor, 8.8. Atlanta's number one at nine. So basically, Oklahoma City is right there with them. But here's the outlier. Miami, who um, has, I think they and Atlanta have the most attempts in that 10 to 14 foot range on the floor. Miami's converting 43.6% of those shots. Oklahoma City's converting 53%. That's the best number in the league from that area that nobody's supposed to shoot from. But as we've learned in the past, kind of like with that Devin Booker, Chris Paul, Phoenix Suns team, where you go, well, yeah, but if your guys are really good at making those shots, it's okay, especially because they're open all the time. And Oklahoma City is better than anybody else in that range. The only other team that's over 50% from that range is Milwaukee. And there's a hand, maybe half the league is like in the 30s from there, like incapable of making that shot if they're even attempting it. So they defend, they shoot it, and they have a closer in SGA. Last night, for a good reason, this is the stuff I think that's fun, and we keep coming back to it. It starts to turn into a bit of an SGA Tatum thing. Uh, if you didn't know and you needed this reminder, they're both still 25 years old, which was like, wait, Tatum still? Like, what? He's 26 in March. SGA is 26 in July, so only a few months of separation. Look, Tatum has had the better career. So if you feel like Tatum is still held in higher regard than SGA is, um, and maybe he is, I don't know if that's going to happen after this year, and I'm going to share a couple numbers with you that maybe puts that one to bed. But Tatum, look, he's had the better career. He's had the bigger playoff moments. You know, Losing in the finals and losing against Miami, to me, those are not like devastating. These other guys can't even get it out of the second round. At least he's doing that. I know it's not perfect. I know the Celtics offense late is always something we're going to be a little worried about. I've done a deep dive on that, trying to find the numbers that show us anything. Um, some misleading numbers in there, but he's had way more playoff success. SGA's had 13 playoff games to his career. However, if you want to say today that SGA is the better player, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. And the analytics would back you up in a big way. These numbers are pretty like surprising. I, I didn't even know it was this much separation. You go the last two years. I know PER isn't perfect. Win share is 48. But look, win share is 48. That tells you if you're a stud. All right. There's no flukes in the win, share, win shares for 48. If you're playing a lot, like the number one guy in the league is Embiid. Number two is SGA. Number three is Jokic. Number four is Giannis. Number five is Halliburton. All right? So right now, if you look at win shares per 48 the last two years, Tatum was at .185. SGA last year is .226. This year, Tatum is actually down a bit from last year at .163. SGA is at .310. I know that number may not mean a lot to many of you listening, but what I am telling you, what I'm promising, you have a three at the beginning of that. That is like all time stuff. Okay. And that also speaks to how absurd Embiid's stats are that he's actually ahead of SGA at this point. So the metrics, the PER 24 and 21 for Tatum in the last two years, 27 and 31 for SGA the last two years. So these last two years, we've seen a massive uh, Gilgis Alexander jump on what kind of player he is. And, you know, when I say it out loud and I listen to the whole thing, the playoff success thing is real. I can see people still fighting for Tatum. The metrics are telling any, any Tatum backer right now, you're, you're not even close. And you're getting hammered this year in comparing those two players. Uh, and, and again, these are not, I know people kind of, oh, these all made up. <laughs> these aren't made up numbers. I mean, somebody made them up. But if you're like, I'm not telling you Josh Hart's sixth, shout out to maybe one of the best social media guys going to the game. So now what? They are the second youngest team in the NBA. 24 years, that's the average age of this Thunder roster. Only San Antonio is younger in the NBA this season. These teams do not historically win NBA titles. All right? Let's do some history. The youngest team to win a title, the Portland Trailblazers, 1977. Average age, 24 years old. Same as the Thunder. Hey, man. Okay, but that was 46 years ago, guys. <laughs> 47 years ago. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't recent. It wasn't recent. So what's the next youngest team? Do you remember the 55, 56 Philadelphia Warriors? Because I don't. Are there any recent teams that were young that won a title? Well, I have one for you. It's the 14, 15 Warriors, average age, 26 years old for that roster. So that's pretty good. There's something there, right? Because normally a young team like this Thunder team 
where it is certainly new-ish, as good as they look, and all those numbers I've just shared with you, and a real guy, a real number one. But again, you can't truly be like a real number one unless I see you have like some threats in the playoffs. I'm not saying you have to get to the conference finals every single year, but I think you understand what I'm saying. Um, At least they have that. But the recent history of all this stuff, like if you go the 10 youngest teams that have won titles, four were in the 1970s, five were in the 1950s, and then you have the 2014-15 Warriors. But I think it's more about when you look at the Thunder, it would be a little dismissive to go, up. Oh, they're young, whatever, they can't win it. Because really, I think it's about the West and the West this year. Is there anyone that you're that scared of? You have to pay respect to Denver. And I know, you know, with Gordon out for a little while, Murray was gone for a bit. Um, I, I could see them, like, I think it's human nature a little bit after that title to cruise a bit. But we know now, whatever playoff issues we were worried about with Denver's defense, maybe some of that stuff, it wasn't, it wasn't enough to derail them. And then they rolled towards the end. I mean, they were clearly the best team in the NBA last year. So I think you always have to kind of put that one, but is it insurmountable? Be a big ask for a team with no playoff real seasoning to go up against Denver and beat them. Uh, it also depends on kind of how the the seating plays out and whether or not they be getting four on the road in Denver. Um, then the rest of the West, I know Minnesota's ahead of them. As we mentioned at the top, uh, Minnesota's late offense is starting to really worry me. It is. And that's a huge worry to have going, what will that offense that looks like it's struggling and trying to find its identity late in regular season games, what will that look like in the playoffs? Who knows? Maybe it gets kind of fixed. The rest of the teams, the Lakers, you want to buy stock in them right now? I know it was a brutal December schedule with some of the stuff they had to go through. Um, and sometimes the story is told like in the month, right? And how that's playing out. Because I, I want to go back and look this up. I don't know if it's Oklahoma City that has this brutal January. Because, um, you know, like the Philadelphia 76ers had a really like easy schedule there for a bit. It felt like, man, are they playing Charlotte and Detroit again this week? Um, anyway, the point is, I don't know that it's about the age as much as you go, who are you afraid of the start of 24 that much in the West? And I don't think there's a perfect answer for it, but it's still early enough to know that it's probably going to change. I think the last thing that I'd ask on this is that we know about the trades that they've made and the stockpile of draft picks. If you look at Sam Quinn's piece on CBS.com, who did a really good job of explaining this before the season started, just laying it all out. Oklahoma City from this point on to 2030 has 15 first round draft picks and 22 second round picks, but only nine of those 15 first rounders are guaranteed to be first rounders as of today. Five can become second rounders. The Utah pick could expire by 26 if it doesn't convey. And I think the question to finish here would be this. Do we need to think about the Thunder's assets differently because they're this good right now? Because whenever you talk about them, oh, well, they can trade for anybody. And you're like, yeah, but Presti's smart. He's not going to just trade for a guy knowing he's moving all these picks. He's not going to pay the three good first round price for the next Mad All-Star, knowing that the next Mad All-Star is never picking Oklahoma City to be his top destination. Now, we can sit here and pretend like, man, they're really good. Why wouldn't an All-Star want to go there? Look, I'd still be shocked. There'd be nothing funnier than if Durant demanded a trade back there. Phoenix gets bounced early, but that's just an aside. I think there's probably even some LeBron, LeBron jokes out there uh, if Oklahoma City were to go on some kind of run. But the, the reality, the non-meme evaluation of this, the reality could be, all right, so I don't think Presti would just give up a ton of picks or somebody he can't sign, but did he know that they would be this good? Could we look at the Thunder going, all right, whatever, we'll pay the price because we have a chance to win a championship this year, which is the entire point of doing the job, where we have such a surplus that I can pay the higher price, knowing I'm probably not retaining this guy, but that we add a dude that makes them the clear, clear favorite in the West. Because they might be it right now. It's just too early for me to completely sign off and say it's Oklahoma City and everybody else. But they could look different and even better because of the way they're positioned. 